Hi everybody, it's Dr. Doug, and I want to talk to you today about what is LGBTQIAAP affirmative psychotherapy. There's a lot of letters in there, I know. What is that kind of therapy? Why it's called affirmative? What it does? Who it helps? And how people can be trained in it and how to look for it? But first, I'm going to let you know that I actually founded the nation's first LGBT specialization in clinical psychology in 2006 at Antioch University, Los Angeles. We all worked very, very hard and all of us instructors and folks trained a lot and spent years and years and years refining our curriculum and our students graduated with honors to become excellent LGBTQ affirmative clinicians. The program is still running. I found it and ran it for 10 years, but it's still running strong and proud and I'm so grateful to have produced that organization and it's still alive and well today. That brings me to want to talk to you about what is that kind of therapy. First I want to get into the history, then we'll talk about how the therapy works and what it does. So let's get into some history. Back in the day, therapy was mostly called psychoanalysis and it was a very kind of uptight, classical, not the best form of therapy. We can talk about that later. But what it did do because of a bad misreading of Sigmund Freud's ideas is that it had this idea that homosexuality was a mental disorder and was a sickness. I can't explain to you enough how many gay and queer people's lives were ruined because they felt themselves to be sick due to their actually God-given beautiful impulses to love the same sex or to be a gender variant person. They felt themselves to be sick. The time period was so homophobic, racist, and sexist that no one knew any better. And these therapists were getting away, literally, with murder. If you wanted to go into therapy or psychoanalysis in the 50s, you had to promise you were never going to touch a person of the same sex. And furthermore, it was thought that we were going to try to change your sexual orientation because it was a disorder to heterosexual or heteronormative. Now, all of us queer people know, ain't no way you're going to change us. We were born that way. We feel this way to the core. So the whole idea that you could change a person's sexual orientation is really an anathema and is a crime against humanity. But that was the prevailing therapy back in the day and it damaged many, many people's lives. This all began to change. Well, it was starting to change because there were gay activists organizing in Los Angeles, very important movement called the Madagin Society, but it all sort of exploded in the red letter date in 1969. That's known as the Stonewall Rebellion. That's when a group of trans and people of color gays in the Stonewall Inn bar in New York City in Greenwich Village could not tolerate police invasions and hauling them out to jail just for congregating at a freaking bar. So they stood up to the police, they threw bricks and bottles and they just kept the police at bay. And in three days, bam, the whole Manhattan, all the mainstream gays went down to the Stonewall Inn. The New York Times, the Village Voice wrote about it and bam, gay liberation was born after then. In some ways, the whole thing changed and all the work that gay activists had done up until then consolidated in New York City. Eventually, there were gay pride marches in New York City, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco. We get the gay pride movement, gay liberation movement, LGBTQ liberation in 1969. So, you know, sexual liberation, everything starts to change. Some of the therapists who were actually trained to help their clients who themselves were gay said, F this, I'm actually not going to participate in what was then called the sickness model, the Freudian model at that time. No freaking way. As a matter of fact, I'm going to see my gay clients as dignified human beings whose gayness makes them special and even spiritual. And I'm actually going to come out to my clients as a lesbian therapist, as a gay therapist, 
as a trans therapist, although the trans movement picks up speed more in the 90s. That's amazing. Can you imagine a therapist who is there with you who says to you, you know what? I'm gay too, and I feel great about it. Let's help you say no to the place inside of you that says being queer is a sickness. That voice is a sickness, not your homosexuality, not your gender variance. Wow, that just changes everything. So therapy begins to adopt what's called a much more humanistic attitude, not pathologizing, not pathologizing, not pathologizing in any way, shape, or form. If a client comes to you and says, I think I'm gay because I was molested, well, you listen to what the client has to say, but in the back of your mind, so how can I help this person realize that their gayness is inborn, is beautiful, is God-given, and is essential? It is not caused by their trauma. It is not caused by your trauma. That's the big breakthrough. L-G-B-T-Q-I-A-P. All of those letters are actually places of enormous pride because they say no to moral conformity and no to heteronormativity. Those places need to be cherished. So that's the beginning of LGBTQ affirmative psychotherapy. Big part of another aspect in history is the Gay Activist Alliance realized that it was the American Psychiatric Association that was actually putting homosexuality as a mental disorder in the DSM, the Bible of Diagnosis. For those of you who don't know, most of us clinicians have a love-hate relationship with the DSM. That's where all the diagnoses are. We need to use it in order to help you get your medication and understand what the treatment approach is, but oftentimes those diagnoses are just socially constructed and are not inherently true. So back in the day, Gay Activist Alliance got the American Psychiatric Association to take homosexuality out of the DSM no longer as a mental disorder. But after 1973, when homosexuality is removed from the DSM as a mental disorder, lots of researchers start getting organized and writing papers about how actually to study homosexuality and gender variants as normal. We even get the Vivian Cass stages of how a person emerges from being in the closet as a little child progressively to opening up, to feeling confused, to tolerating their differences from other people and accepting who they are. There's a staged model of how a person moves from being in the closet and self-hating to eventually coming into what we call LGBTQ pride, and that starts to get developed. There are models of identity developed. What does it even mean to move from being in the closet to feeling so good about how you love and how you understand your gender identity that you actually develop a new identity about who you are? That's a very important topic and a great mystery how an actual LGBTQ person comes into their own identity. We can study that a heck of a lot more. That has to do with moving from self-hatred to greater self-esteem. All of this work is accumulating papers, books are written, all kinds of things are happening. And even uh, a lot of stuff happens during the AIDS crisis where even more healthy therapy is developed. This culminates in another important red letter day in the year 2000 when the American Psychological Association publishes guidelines for the ethical treatment of lesbian, gay, and bisexual clients. 16 of those. I'm going to go over those in a future YouTube. 16 guidelines that are extremely important, the most important of which are to indicate that homosexuality, bisexuality must never be confused as a mental disorder, but as natural and indigenous to the human being, enormously important, even to this day. I meet so many clients who still feel themselves to be in some ways wrong, or there's something wrong with them for being who they are. That's a big statement. Another